Okay. All right, welcome to the U.S. Kingdom Conversation. As we're logging on, we're uh, looking forward to today's session. I'm gonna turn things over quickly to Andy so he can lead us in, uh, in our time together today. So thank you. Andy, the mic is yours. Thank you. Okay, Andy, can you hear me? The mic is yours. If you're uh, you're available there. Okay, I had to log back on again. All right. Hi guys, forgive me again. This thing this thing seems to give up give up a little um. A little bother the moment I log in, but um, good to have all of you on today. Um, let me see uh, who's on there. Let me give a quick hello and hi to anybody who I need to say a quick hello to. Bruce Tuttle, good to see you, man. What's happening, my man, Mr. Bruce? <coughs> I see you on the call there, Bruce. How's happening, man? All good here in uh, sunny California. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to uh, receiving a blessing today. Excellent, man. Excellent, excellent. Okay, people are jumping on, so um, uh, let's give them a little time to kind of chime in. But let me um, let me kind of um, open up my presentation today. Very, very brief, not a very extensive presentation. Just a matter of um, giving context to today's um, to today's meeting um, and going forward. Let me kind of get this done. Excuse me a second. Um, what's going on here, man? Okay, there we go. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, I'm just doing it again, man. Sorry, guys. This thing is constantly giving me problems. It's going again. I'll, I'll have to log out. Please forgive me. I'll have to log out and come back in. Something is wrong with this whole operation. So please forgive me. Kevin, hold the talk for a while. Okay. All right. Um, again, welcome to those of you who uh tell me Bruce, it's good seeing you. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, there's uh, others uh, steady logging on here. Good morning. Good afternoon, good night. We have uh, some special guests from out of West Africa as well, who have joined us. Welcome to you, good to have you on. And this is going to be uh, an exciting time of sharing and coming together. So I think we have Anderson just about here to log on, okay. Okay, I need to get the right to share my screen. You got it, you got it, uh-huh. All right. Screen sharing. Forgive me, guys. I don't know what's it's. I don't know what's going on with that. It seems to be. I'll try to find out the reason for that problem that we have every week. I think we're good. You're on. Okay, good. Can you all see me? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Good. Hi, right, guys. Um, let me um <coughs> welcome all of you to the conversation this afternoon. And I guess more persons will be logging in as we go forward today and in the weeks to come. Um, over the last couple months, we know that this meeting started primarily as a, as a focused meeting for a group in LA. It was first of, all, first of all called an LA conversation, LA Kingdom conversation. Then we expanded that to all of the US. And then we shifted it not too long ago for it to be a global conversation. And um, we've been constantly saying that we want to kind of rejig the format as best as we can. And so what I want to do today is to kind of identify um, some of the uh, basic formats that we'd utilize on this particular platform so that we could be able to bring maximum value to you. What you're going to get, those of you who have shared your emails with the secretariat, that will be Kelvin Chambers, um, you will get uh, pushed out to you within the next couple of days or even by this afternoon, um, the, eight, the eight purpose uh, objective, the eight objectives that we have for this meeting on a Thursday. There are eight objectives that we've identified 
We're going to push that out to you. And the reason why we're going to get it in your hands is so that you could have it, number one, and then we could then expand on it or clarify it for you. So you will have the eight objectives that we have identified for this Thursday meeting pushed out to you later today. And then we would maybe next week spend some time to quickly look at it and then get into the meeting as follows. So let me talk about the what we're going for here. You've, you've constantly heard us talk about the need for us to dispense of the talk shop model. The talk shop model is the model that we've grown accustomed to in Christianity. You know, a preacher comes, he screams at you, you sit down, whether you agree, you disagree, whether you understand or you don't understand, um, you just sit there and, and, and receive or rather and listen, and then you walk away. Um, it used to be worse back in the day in the 1500s, Martin Luther fought against uh, an extreme talk shop model where the church was literally being spoken to in a language that they did not understand. But people have grown so accustomed to just kind of sitting in this monastic mode, shaking their heads and going through a religious disposition, whether they understand or don't understand. We've tried to tweak it and amend it, but there is the need for us to kind of move past the talk shop model. Now we can easily find ourselves putting a little gloss on what has always been done, but at the same time, what has constantly yielded no results. In other words, we could maintain a talk shop model with a little gloss, a little interaction, a little small talk, a little opening up for people's comments and commentaries and give people options to kind of disagree. There's a little gloss on what we've always done, but let's face it, that model has never worked for the past 2000 years. Or we could find ourselves doing what I call the retronym dance. The retronym dance is where we find a fanciful way of doing what we've always done by calling it a name that we've never had before. So today, a lot of organizations are no longer using the word networks. They use other fanciful terms, but deep in the inside, it is still a network. It is denominational, it is cultic, it is extreme. And so that's what I call the retronym dance. We just put a new label on an old practice and we assume that the new fanciful label represents a change in the whole operation. That we won't do. In other words, we could easily say, well, let's have a little collaborative talk. And at the same time, we are still incorporating a more, more sorry, of the, of the talk shop platform. That is what the Bible describes as putting new wine in an old skin. In other words, systems are important because systems can do one of two things. Either it contaminates the content or it contributes to leakage of the content because you put new wine in old wine skin, the new wine will burst the skin, therein you have leakage. You can have real good, real good content, but if the structure is, an, it is inadequate, then you can easily compromise the content or result in massive leakage. And so we must be concerned about either the compromising of the content or the leakage of the content. And so we have to be constantly amending the systems and formats and structures that we utilize. And so today I wanna to identify some other things that we wanna do. So we want to explore three perspectives. Now, let me clearly say, while we introduce three perspectives, the objectives are very important. These perspectives, are not designed to add, these perspectives are designed rather, that would not, should not be there. These perspectives are designed to add some flavor and color to what can easily become a monotonous bore. So if you do the same thing all the time, it could easily become a monotonous bore. So please remove that would not. So these, these perspectives are designed to add some flavor and some color to what can easily become a monotonous bore. However, at the heart of what we are seeking to do, at the heart of our efforts, is an attempt on our part to see what we can do to bring greater value to everyone who joins this call. This is what we want. At the end of the day, we are not amending things only to give it a little color, only to say, well, we're doing things a little differently. We are really trying to explore ways by which we can get maximum value to every person who joins this call. How can we 
<laughs> maximize the two hours that we spend together? How can we bring content, not just content, but provide a, 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 a sphere or a world for you to really step into the best version of yourself? And so this is at the heart of what we are trying to do. Now, we may not do it perfectly every single time. We, I'm sure some of you in, in, in on this call may come up with better ideas. And so we welcome your ideas. We welcome your ideas. And so what we want is to bring maximum value. We are absolutely deadly committed to the empowerment of all and the activation of all. And so whatever we do, whatever amendment, whatever tweaking, whatever addition, whatever new systems we put in place, those last two bullets are critically important. Those last two bullets will identify what we are attempting to do. What we really want is how can we bring maximum value to every person <coughs> who logs into this call? We are deadly committed to the empowerment of all and the activation of all. As you see in the little tagline, in that blue ribbon to the bottom, that's an important ribbon. It basically says the committee of the whole room what we want is every single person from the least of us to the greatest of us standing in the fullness of what God has ordained for us. And so we are only making a small contribution, two hours, once a week on a Thursday, a small contribution towards you standing in the fullness of what God has ordained for you. So let's identify these three, three platforms that we want to, want to utilize. One, we'll use something called Tutorial Thursdays. A Tutorial Thursdays. This is a lot, this is a lot of what we do at the moment. The, word, the concept of a tutorial in university is where a professor or a lecturer comes with a specific topic to speak to his class or his audience, and then he provides opportunity for his class or his students or his audience to kind of engage him. That level of engagement would involve areas that of disagreement, they are free to disagree, will involve areas of expanding some of the ideas, it will involve areas of seeking further clarity. And so we are utilizing, we are, we are designating our, our Thursdays, one of the format that we utilize, what we call the tutorial Thursdays. What do we want to do here? The accustomed, this is the accustomed model, the accustomed deep dive format where we will use members of the core team. We, are, we identify the core team. So this accustomed format where we take deep dive into the word of God, using members of the core team, using attendees, those of you in this meeting, attendees that we identify as having relevant content, having a definite call. One of the advantages of your feedback and your contributing in this particular platform is that allow, it allows us to kind of spy a little into your capacity. And so we do not want you to sit there with massive capacity and we don't at least benefit from what you carry. And so from time to time, we will identify some of you who are attendees in this meeting with massive capacity as having, you have relevant content, content but apart from that, we're gonna invite other guests to address targeted topics. So the, 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 the tutorial Thursdays, let me define it again. This is the accustomed deep dive format where we use members of the core team, where we use attendees that we identify as having relevant capacity, and we use invited guests to address targeted top topics that we will continue to do. For this to happen, we expect all persons who present to do in-depth research, to have very intentional languaging, to have very thoughtful analysis, to have very relevant doctrine, to be highly impartational, and to be intensely interactive. Now, those six points there are six very critical piece in six critical pieces inside of the tutorial Thursdays. And that's what we've been doing over the last couple of months, very in-depth research. You realize that every presentation has a depth of study, a depth of research. So anybody who presents on a tutorial Thursday, we expect to have in-depth research, intentional languaging, thoughtful analysis, relevant doctrine, highly impartational and intensely interactive, meaning what? Meaning in every single presentation, we want to have room for interaction, for engagement, for questions, for expansion of the ideas, for, for clarity of the concepts. You don't want anyone to sit there and just say, wow, that's very deep. But then we ask, how, how much of it you understood? You don't understand, but it just says deep. Now, one of the terms that you see there 
let me underscore it. You see that issue of languaging, that's important. Languaging is important because um, something about our choice of words, if you use words that you're accustomed hearing, sometimes it contributes to static mentalities. So if I come on this platform, I talk about the Great Commission, your mind almost goes into a state of relaxation because something tells you, I know what that is. You talk about um, soul winning, I know what that is. And your mind enters into that state of relaxation. And so on this platform, we are very, very careful with intentional languaging because languaging shakes you out of your comfort zone. Let me give you something I wrote here. Listen to this. Huh? Words, very important principle. Words carve out the world into distinguishable and digestible pieces, rendering it comprehensible. That's what words do. Words has the ability to take a complex thing, break it into small parts, and make it distinguishable and digestible. Then it allows us to cognitively engage with those pieces that were once unrecognizable. Now, that's a quote that's important for you to get because it speaks into why we use certain types of words, because we don't want your mind to collapse into or collapse into a state of ease where you're not thinking. Sometimes we deliberately introduce certain types of vocabulary in order to force you to think differently, number one. But at the same time, it is the best language we could possibly find in order to carve out this complex world called the kingdom and make it digestible and distinguishable and comprehensible, that you can see it and understand it. Words do that. Words do that. The second platform that we want to utilize, second platform. Number one, we said the, the, the tutorial Thursday. The second one is, uh, sorry, the format is wrong because the, the, the graphic should have come in first, but who cares? Um, this, is, this would be what we call the line. Let me go down and then we're going to get back to it. It's called the line. I told you last week what liming is. Liming is a term that we use in Trinidad that was introduced to our culture um, in the days when um, all these European sailors would be coming to the Caribbean. In those days, they, they discovered our Caribbean rum. And so the sailors would be on the boat drinking rum and lime, and uh, they would not be very productive. And so in order to get some level of productivity from the sailors, the captain said he will designate one hour where they could drink their rum and lime, and that one hour was called liming. So you could lime, you could drink your rum and lime, and it has become a part of Trinidad culture. It is so much a part of our culture that, that, that Trinidad is one of those very affable, very friendly, very spontaneous, ready to have a small talk kind of environment. For example, I could be cutting my lawn on a Saturday morning and somebody just randomly passes by and say, hi, Anderson. And that becomes a line. Lawn, no longer cutting. You, you basically turn on the barbecue pit and you have a drink, you have a meal. And what started off as me cutting lawn turns out into an all day Lime. That's part of our Trinidad culture. It's not that way in every other nation. In Barbados, you can't spontaneously jump on someone and have a line. In Barbados, you have to call and confirm you're coming in advance. Now, this is what the line would look like. The line is an unrehearsed interaction. Let me back up so you can see it clearly. Sorry. The line is an unrehearsed interaction with persons or a person, and it's intended to achieve certain objectives an unrehearsed interaction. Nobody, you don't go there with having your notes unrehearsed interaction with a person or persons intended to produce certain objectives. These are, these are the object, objectives. One, to give us a wide-eyed view into what really characterizes a person. So you see certain people with their slant of mind, their perspective of the kingdom, their perspective of faith, a certain type of drive and energy and you want to know well, what drives them, what makes them who they are. So these lime, these liming sessions are designed for us to take a deep dive into a person's life and give us a wide-eyed view into what characterizes that person. It is intended to extract value from their story because it's not just a person telling us about themselves, but ultimately you want to be able to take value from their story. All of us are engaged in a process of our own. 
And sometimes you need a little nudge of encouragement. And sometimes that encouragement is hearing something inside of a ma another man's process that speaks strongly to your own personal journey. And so when you have this line, what you want is to, what we want is to provide you with value so that you could extract value from that story. What is the objective? You want to identify life patterns from those person, that person or those person's discoveries. Identify life patterns from their competencies. Identify life patterns from their stumbles, even their mistakes. Identify life patterns from their very life, their response to life, how they deal with life, all of the complex layers of life. And so when you have a line and you bring a person on the line to have a talk, these are some of the things that you want to walk away with. You want to get a wide eyed view into what really characterizes this person. What characterizes the way he built his church, the, built, the way he built his ministry. What contributes to his travel? He travels around the world. He, built, he builds ministry in different parts of the world. He has a very social, he's, very, he's, he's, a very, uh, he's a very empathetic kind of person. What makes him that way? Extract value from their story and identify life patterns from their discoveries, what they discovered. Identify patterns in their competence. Identify patterns in their mistakes. Identify patterns in their response to life. I have an ellipsis at the end because there's so many other areas that you could draw from. And so that's called the line. And I'm using Trinidad, uh, almost like Trinidad Palance there because in Trinidad, uh, most Trinidadians don't pronounce their THs. So in Trinidad, you say the line, that's very unusual. Most people say the line. So uh, where are you going today? I'm going down by the croppers. You know, I'm going down by the croppers. I'm not like I'm going by the croppers. When somebody uses their THs like that, it means that person is either very intelligent or very deliberate in putting their THs together. So in Trinidad, you'll hardly say the line. They say the line, the line. So it's, it would be nice to hear some of you try to capture that. So Kelvin Chambliss, let me see if you could get the line. Let me see. The line. You hear? Let, let me hear. The line. The line. The line. Let me get an English voice inside of there. Uh, um, is there an Englishman in the house who would be willing to attempt the line? Who is there? Who is there? Who's an Englishman in the house? Anyone in there who want to, who want to attempt that? An Englishman? There's no Englishman in the house. The right, line. The line, excellent. All right, the last format, the last format that we want to deal with. Uh, no, no, this is just a quote. This is a quote, sorry. I'm kind of jumping, jumping ahead of myself. This is an important point, looking at examining a person's life. This is, this is a statement from Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around it. So some of you think you know me, but you only know me at a certain level because you have never walked in my shoes. You've never climbed into my skin. There are certain things that makes me who I am. There are certain experiences that makes me who I am. There are certain perspectives that have formed my entire existence. And so what we wanna do in the line is to provide you with an opportunity to climb into a person's skin for a moment. And so you can walk away with value. Listen to this I wrote here. A person's skin is the prevailing circumstances and the labyrinth of past, immediate, and real life, real time situations that create a series of multiple realities through which that person had and has to navigate. That gives you, the observer, an appreciation for and a greater understanding of that person. The moment you begin to really kind of remove the layers of a person's life and begin to see what happens beneath the hood, you suddenly have a wow moment. Oh, that is why he is like that. That is why he thinks the way he does. That is why there's a certain level of passion in a certain area. That is why. And, and so the line is providing you with an opportunity to jump into a person's skin for a few minutes to see what's happening inside of them. The third format that we wanna utilize on this platform is what we call a PAC Thursday, P-A-C, PAC Thursday. PAC basically speaks to practicums, activation, 
and case studies. Now, this one may require some complexity. It will have some complexities in it, sorry. But we're going to utilize moments to provide you with practicums and activation and case study because there are so many layers to the faith that sometimes we can't experience in a church service. And just a while ago, um, we were having a little discussion and it was mentioned that so much of what we do, it is designed for a, a church building. It is designed for a church service and it's not designed for life. The kingdom is not designed for us to hide away in a building. It is not designed for activities we, put, we, we perform in a church service. It is designed for life. And so what we want in our pack Thursdays is to really pack the meeting or pack a session with practicums, activation, and case studies. And this also has specific objectives. One, we want to provide what I call simulating situations. Simulating situations. You know when a pilot has to learn to fly a plane, he doesn't jump into the plane the first day he flies. He goes into a simulator. And so all of the, all of the experiences, the situations, the, 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 the turbulence, the experience, all of that in a simulator. And so our pack Thursdays are designed to provide you with simulating situations and circumstances in order to arm you with what I call ninja type anticipation in a real life situation. In other words, if you have to prophesy what, how do you live in a state of activation? What are some of the basic techniques that you have to understand to hear the voice of God? What does the voice of God sound like? How do you switch that on? How do you manage a situation in your church? Let's assume that the majority of your young people, they have no interest in God. They come there because their mother sent them or their, or their father sent them. How do you deal with a complex teenager? These are real life situations that we have to deal with. How do you deal with a drug addict? How do you manage those circumstances? And so apart from just giving you information, we have to create real life situations, simulation situations and circumstances in order to arm you with ninja type anticipation and real life situations. What is the objective of the practicum or the pack sessions? It is designed to stir and awaken the spirit, not just your mind, in order to respond to life more profoundly. And so sometimes in these pack Thursdays, we may have just prayer. We may have maybe about an hour of just intense prayer, these things we need to do. We may have intense moments of just dealing with matters and dealing with situations in all kinds of different ways, all right? So these are the three formats that we're introducing to you to. Number one is the, is the tutorial Thursdays. Number two is the pack Thursdays. And number three is D-Line. And so today, we're going to have another line. So we're having a line. And so um, anybody have a comment or question before we jump into today's line? We're having a line today. We line in. Any comments, questions, feedback? If there's none, then let's get into this. I'm going to take off that screen. And let's get into this line. Today, we have Dave Cropper. Dave Cropper is a is a friend, a brother, a colleague. Cropper, you on? You there? Come here. You're there, Mr. Cropper. Hey. We, we in. Welcome to the line. Thanks, man. We line in today. I, I don't know. I mean, you travel all over the world, so I don't even know if you could still say that Trinity thing called the line. Maybe you might you might say the line or something of the sort. Oh, believe me. Believe me. It's the line. The line. <laughs> Right now, we're down in the line. In the line, right. That is a pure trinity right there. Guys, let me introduce all of you to Cropper, Dave Cropper. If you don't know him, he would have been on this platform before. He would have spoken on this platform before. Um, let me kind of introduce Dave by taking the little um, scenic route. And I want you all to get to know him, get to appreciate him, value what he brings and who he is. I, I've known Dave Cropper for a very, very long time. He and I were members of the same church. And... Um, We've maintained dynamic relationships. Let me go further by saying that uh, uh, Dave Cropper walked away from the church that I used to be a part of, the organization I was a part of. And he was one of the guys who was constantly provoking and prodding at me and saying, well, I mean, God, I understand. God is talking to you in all kinds of different ways. How do you plan to walk in those many things that God is saying you inside of the structure that you live out of? Didn't say it in such words, but that is what he was after. Uh, eventually, Dave and I got a little bit more tight 
about eight years ago, we got really connected in all kinds of ways, all kinds of circumstances came about that led to him and I getting really, really close. Dave and I spent copious amounts of time praying together, designing and thinking into a lot of stuff that we're doing now. A lot of things that we do now across the world, um, they were thought about, they were considered, they were mused and dreamed into uh, in, his, in his studio in Trinidad. Many, many days we sat down and we dreamed about all kinds of stuff. And so uh, Dave continues to be one of my most trusted friends. And um, I could say not only as a friend, but uh, his wisdom, I glean from, from time to time. I have a lot of value for this man. He is uh, a prophet, carries a very strong prophetic anointing, just came back from the Congo, the Democratic of the Congo, and also was in South Africa where he was doing some conferences down, conferences down there. So this is a, a somewhat scenic but somewhat succinct version of Dave Cropper. So Cropper, come, welcome to the line. Let me ask you, what going on with you? What happening with you? What's your story? What's your story? What happening with you? Well, right now, as far as the story goes, well, I'm just back, freshly back. And um, as life goes, there's still life management that hasn't stopped. <laughs> Bills still got to be paid. Um, I have businesses to tend to. I have wife and family in a different country that I have to, and I'm actually there right now in Barbados, spending time with my family. My daughter's birthday was yesterday. And, um, you know, alongside ministry, life still has to be lived. So I am paying copious attention to that. And um, I head back to Trinidad later today. But, um, yeah, that's what's going on with me right now. Okay, you just, um, Dave, tell me about, I mean, one of the things we said about the line last week, we had the first one and I loved it, loved it, loved it. But one of the things you mentioned last week is that, um, what is true and truth? It's a Jewish proverb, what is true and truth? It is your story. So tell us, tell us about your story. I know that you had an experience with a taxi driver or something of the sort. I can't tell it like you can, but tell us about your story. But in, in your story, um, as we mentioned before, uh, I want those of you listening to this conversation to kind of, you may have a similar experience or maybe you must have had one and you are still trying to put the pieces of your story together. So Kropper, tell us about your story. How this thing started? How did you come to know the Lord, number one? How did you come into the awareness of your gifting? How did you come into the awareness of, um, of, your, of your grasp and your comprehension of God? Tell us about that. Tell us, give us the, give us the, 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 the long circuitous route. Okay, um, I have one of those interesting stories that um, really did start <laughs> at the age of 16, where I was liming in Port of Spain one Friday afternoon uh, after school. And um, as with any teenager, just hanging around with your friends and, and just doing that kind of stuff. When for, I, I had a, a sense that came upon me, I couldn't articulate what it was at the time, but now I can define it as a strong sense that said, leave town and head home quickly. And I looked for the fastest vehicle out of town. I, I, I felt a real urgency that I needed to get out, almost as if my life depended on it. And I jumped into this taxi. Usually I would take a bus that has music and everything. But I jumped into a small taxi, just seats four passengers. And I sat at the back. And let's say it takes 20 miles to get home after getting to five miles along the way. Everyone else had their stop and it was just myself and the taxi driver left for the duration of the journey. And he's in the front seat and he's talking about, oh, well, God is doing this and he's doing this here and he's doing this there. And at the age of 16, I started to challenge him. I was like, you know, how do you know that God is real. What's your proof? You know, how can you tell the authenticity of the Bible? This was written by men. These are stories that guys put together. And I challenged the guy at no end with my 16 year old vigor. And along the way, he said these five words. He said, let me tell you something. And with those five words, the entire atmosphere in the car changed. I was properly freaked out. Like every pore in my body was raised. And then he began a discourse in telling me, I have been here where you were, and they tried to take my life. You have received this instruction when you were in this location. You've received that when you're in that location. 
And he began to recall to me instances of him being in places that I was, and I had no knowledge of his presence. That properly freaked me out. And then he told me, I have a message for you. And the message was, I said, what's the message? He said, I have a message for you, which is the father wants you to come to him. So that's it. He said, yeah, that's it. That's the message. So I, he dropped me to my house. I asked him for his contact details. He handed me a card with some information on it. I went inside and I prayed for the first time. And I said, all right, Father, God, whoever you are, if you are God and you, you are who you say you are, then you have the ability or the capacity to make yourself known without confusion. If you could create man and build a whole planet, then a self-revealing is nothing for you. I said, okay, if you are God, you reveal yourself to me. That was the end of my prayer. And I went my way. Three weeks after, I was heading out to go online again, <laughs> started on the junction. And the same car that, that, that he was in drove past the corner, but he didn't stop. He didn't stop. He just stuck his head out of the car and he looked at me and the guy looked straight into my soul. And when he stood, when he, when he was staring at me, I felt a huge guilt <laughs> and very, very troubled that I didn't follow up on the instruction that I received. So I went back home and I started to read the Bible. And when I opened the pages of the book for the first time, the thing just began to make sense. I began to understand scripture. I began to hear the voice of God talking to me. I would have questions and I would be directed where to read and how to understand scripture actually. And this was something that happened by myself. There was no one there. There was no coach. There was no pastor. There was no church. It was just me and God. And I started to really learn about who God is just by my time spent in interacting with the word. That led to me meeting other friends along the way. And um, on one particular occasion, one of the guys that I knew, uh, he said, listen, um, you have to be baptized and you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I was like, filled with the Holy Spirit? What was that? He said, well, you can read about it, you know, talking about speaking in tongues. I was like, ah, that weird thing that you all do? No, nah, man, I real good. <laughs> but on this particular evening, he visited me and I couldn't, um, I couldn't pray at home as a child. My parents were kind of weirded out that I went from party in Lyman and hanging out as a, as a normal teenager to just wanting to go to church and go to prayer meeting and go to these things. She was like, my, my mom was like, what's happening with you? So they didn't receive me at home praying and praying loudly, especially. So I used to pack a bag and head up in the mountains. And on this evening, I did, I did that. A friend of mine came and we went up in the mountain. He said, today you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. I said, fine, let's, let's go. I'm all ready for the Holy Spirit. I've read about it and I've seen it in scripture and it's real. And as he, he said, just, just close your eyes and begin to talk to God and ask him, come into my life, fill me up with your Holy Spirit. And as I began to do that, this is me up in a mountain. It's looking like half past six, seven o'clock at night. Dark mosquitoes buzzing around. And as I began to rehearse these words before God, I started to hear a still small voice say words for me to repeat. It was kind of unusual, but I stopped and I told my friend, hey, this is what I heard. And he said, yes, yes, that's speaking in tongues. You repeat that. And the more I engaged with what I heard and what I repeated, heard and repeated, a rhythmic flow began to the point where I couldn't control or stop my declaration. Mm. And I began to shift from speaking in tongues to prophesying. So I started to use language that I never used before. I started to declare windows over my life being opened. I started to release things and dispatch things and reorganize things and command things to stop and, 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 and cause things to begin to come forth. So my language changed in that instant. And I left the mountain. <laughs> and one really strange thing happened walking down the mountain. A guy that was walking up where we came from, he, he stood up in shock and awe. And he said, I see a glow over your head. 
I couldn't see anything, but the guy was petrified and mortified. But I knew it represented that something serious really took place in my life. So these are the initial stages and the beginnings that I, <laughs> that I walked in. And uh, I took these experiences and many, many more to, to, to my journey in terms of how it shaped, how I saw, how I interacted with the Lord. And it really just kind of set the course for me being able to hear God more clearly and, um, and grow in what God had called me to do. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me make this point clear to everyone on the call. Um, if you have questions for Dave as he, as he goes through his story and as he makes reference to circumstances in his life, if you have questions for Dave, you could um, either put your hand up or leave a note on the chat. Um, anyone who wants to jump in and, and, and pose a question or, or, or expand on anything he must have said, or if you must have had a somewhat similar experience and you could see almost like, like patterns inside of what he's describing that almost like speaks into your own process, then, um, then please, let me, I would love to hear it. I, I guess we all would love to hear it. Okay. So, Krapo, let me go forward. Let me, um, you, 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 you basically started off this process without church, without pastor, without reverend. God was basically talking to you and schooling you. You found yourself inside of a church environment, formal church environment. And um, I, I know that at some point, um, formal church almost like turned you off. Um, tell me about the turn off. What were some of the things that would have led to, to formal church, uh, Christianity in all of its religious forms. How did that contribute to almost like turning you off? Now, understand it turned you off, but it didn't, didn't switch you off. <laughs> you, you're not switched yeah. off in God. You get yeah. turned off, but not necessarily switched off. So explain to me or tell us, what did you see in that zone that turned you off? But at the same time, there's another question. How did you sustain your spiritual focus without dependency on the church system? Well, this one is an easy question for me because I started with a genuine relationship with the Lord. And that was the thing that directed my life, sustained me, and continues to sustain me to this day. You know, for me, it started, the environment that I was in started to, to not feel right when you are very clear that what God wants you to do is in opposition to how this environment sees you or sees what you should and should not do. And rather than be in disobedience to God who you know, you have a relationship with, you have to make a decision. Do I continue to satisfy the wishes and the demands of the environment in the sake of, in the interest of submission, while everything on the inside, every value you have, every sense of leading, it is in opposition to. At that point, you know, there's a dream and a, and a, and a stress and a confusion that once having left, caused relief, caused a sense of, I suppose just thank you, God, that I didn't remain in a situation that was ultimately uh, detrimental or harmful to me or my relationship with the Lord. So th th there's a clear sense that I had, you know, from a young age of what I would describe as a call. And whether it would have been prophets in the same church that would have came and identified those things prophetically, whether it would have been dreams that God has given me uh, personally, or whether it would have been just the witness of the Spirit speaking to me in my own heart, these things, are cute. when all put together, gave me clear sight and direction as to what God wanted to do with my life. So in, in being obedient to that, um, I think when I realized that the environment was just in a, in a sense, toxic to my journey. That was mm -hmm. when I, I knew that it was time for me to move on. You, you had, a, I remember that time you told me about an experience you had where um, God was talking to you and you, you took the content of what God was saying to you to your supposed spiritual leaders 
and you were almost like 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 rebuked for having heard for having heard the voice <laughs> of God. Remind me and remind us of that situation. And in, 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 my, in my early days, I had something that I called the Red Book. <laughs> and I still have it to this day. Whenever I hear God talking to me about something very, very strong, I would go to this book and I would write it in it. And sometimes it would be words of correction, adjustment, perspectives, whatever it be. I would jot it down in this book. So I had a few encounters where the Lord would talk certain things to me, show me stuff in scripture. And I would just make a lot of clear notes about it. And I felt that it made sense to submit this to my, my pastor. And um, in doing so, I set a meeting and I showed him the contents and he read it. And the first response was, who gave you access to this? You're not supposed to have access to hearing these things. Basically, I was too immature and too young and, 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 and unqualified to hear the voice of God in a particular level. And I was then instructed to desist <laughs> from hearing these voices <laughs> and stop making these notes. At which point you decide, who am I going to listen to? Do I listen to the same Lord that I have taught to, to serve and to listen to? Or maybe there was something that was threatening behind the things that I was hearing, because some of the stuff that I was hearing was in contradiction to that which was being practiced uh, in the community at the time. So I saw where the obvious threat was, and uh, all of that added to the complexity of what it what it was to hear the things that I heard and to, and to submit it for approval, for want of a better term. Um, it, has, it, has, it has so much inside of that that I guess quite a number of persons in this call must have had similar experiences. And um, if at all, a person is not almost like certain that God did in fact speak to them, they can easily, they can easily become muted because uh, spiritual leadership, as it were, almost like deem their hearing as an illegitimate activity. And in that regard, I guess there are so many emerging prophets who are no longer prophets and have never emerged simply because uh, their light has been stuffed out as it were. They were almost like um, um, silenced and they were never given the opportunity to allow the, the, the embers or the early flames of their gifting. No one really took the time to fan those flames so that they could step into the fullness of their purpose. Now, um, let me ask you, Krakow, speak to, speak to that. I mean, how does, imagine I am going through a, a situation like that where I go to my spiritual leaders and I am almost like silenced. What is the, what is the protocol? What is the good behavior? What is the good manner? Because uh, I know that what you are describing was early days of your process. You didn't pick up and run in the opposite direction. The moment you were told that you didn't, you were, you had no right to hear that. What were what were the protocols? What were the attitudes? What were the mentalities? What were the behavioral norms that you incorporated that allowed you to um, remain loyal, remain faithful to the community, as it were, but equally remain faithful to God? What did you utilize? What did you understand that? Well, for me, I am. Um, I began to see. You know, just based on the principle of just being faithful, that um, there are two things that work alongside God's faithfulness to us and our faithfulness to Him. And, you know, while I felt the call of God and I heard God in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a unique way, and I had all these experiences, plenty more experiences, spiritual encounters, and all kind of stuff that was happening. I wasn't, for some reason, I had my frustrations, but I had a deep sense of, 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 of recognition that God was faithful to me. Mm. I rationalized in my heart that I would not have gone through all that I've gone through, called out of the world, re my life reset and, and configured to suit his design for God to then totally feel me at the time when direction and opportunity was needed. So what happened to me? 
was that I grew in the realm of business. And for me, I began to understand that the obedience to whatever God calls you to do, that to me is where my training was. My training was in having a, a capacity in business, being faithful in that, applying myself, and seeing the growth and success that came with learning to hear God in business, learning to negotiate contracts and believe God for successful negotiation, to build teams and to, to do things like that. So my development process may not have been in a seminary, but it was mm -hmm. out there in the real world where I learned to trust God in everything. I trust God in, in, in marriage. I trust God in raising children. It, it became a walk of practicality for me rather than being um, raised up by another man of God that was, you know, that had earmarked me and gave me all of this stuff. My development didn't take place that way. Mm -hmm. My development was staying true to the fact that my time with the Lord was not compromised. You know, in some seasons, I would hear God more and some seasons I would hear God less. But in the seasons where I heard God less, it didn't mean that he was not faithful because I might hear God talking out of the book of Jeremiah one day and then I might see him um, watching a movie and something might drop in my spirit. And what I was learning was how to hear God out of just living life. So it was not, a, it was never a one dimensional type of process where I would only hear God when I'm studying my Bible or anything like that, or when I'm in prayer. Mm -hmm. I would learn to hear the voice of God throughout, you know, whether it be listening to some old message or one of the people that I used to spend time listening to is Miles Monroe. Uh, so there were, even when I was outside of the walls of the church to say, there were certain voices that helped to craft and, and, and minister to me, you know, whether, whether it be books that I've read or messages that I've listened to. I always mm -hmm. kept my ears in an environment uh, where I was not just drinking out of my own, <laughs> my own um, jug of Moby, for mm -hmm. want of a better term. I was always uh, getting trying to, to, to measure what I heard against what other established voices were hearing at the time. Mm. And that's one of the things that kept me balanced rather than just thinking, you know, I, I, I am, I'm hearing by myself, so I don't need, in fact, it, it meant to me that I needed to connect more. So my posture was always connect to the body. Um, let iron sharpen iron. And those are the principles that kept me, I suppose, sane and, and not go, going weird in the in the seasons of you know isolation and the seasons where you know there was no um no established relationship within a kingdom community but then uh, uh, throughout the course of time god would have brought relationships all kinds of relationships um that would have helped to mold and shape and and just bring me to the to the place that i am today good um those of you listening to this all of you on this call two things i want to kind of uh, kind of make clear to you. One is that um, we on this platform would not encourage any form of rebellion. If you, if, you are, if you find yourself in a situation similar to what Cropper found himself in, where you are in a community and um, there is no room being made for the exercise of your gift. And if no room is being made for the exercise of your gift, there's equally no room being made for your development and your maturity. And so if you find yourself in a situation like that, we will not encourage rebellion. We won't encourage that you um, break apart, go and speak evil of, begin to gossip and whisper negatively in the ears of other people. That is one thing that, that I know Cropper never did. And the second thing is if you're a leader here and you have a young Dave Cropper in your community who's coming to you about having heard the voice of God and having experienced almost like the, the direction of God. You know, it's like Samuel coming to Eli and saying, God is talking to me. How do I deal with that? Then I don't want you to feel intimidated by the emergence of ministries around you. I mean, if at all you find a sense of intimidation, check your heart. If as a leader, as a pastor, let's use the language that we all know as a pastor of a spiritual community, you see 
young ministries emerging and you are intimidated by these people coming forth in your community, then check your heart, go and talk to God, go and repent and go and question whether you are in fact called because the objective of your call is to make others competent in their call and to, and to bring them into the fullness of their responsibility. And if you don't feel that you are competent within yourself to help a person who has all of these desires for God and, and, and uh, summons from the Lord, then look among your relationships and see how you can facilitate uh, the development of an individual where you feel that you are not fully qualified to assist them. But silencing um, uh, and just dismissing individuals like that is not in the best interest of correct building and not in the best interest of really developing people. Uh, someone had a hand up. Lil Lillian, you had your hand up earlier. Sorry for ignoring you. You had your hand up. Let me ask you to pose your question or a comment. Uh, Lillian, out of, um, out of Liberia, uh, are you hearing me? Yeah, thank you. How are you? Hi, everybody. Um, it's really interesting how, Dave, you, um, your story just really tracks with mine in many ways because that is really how um, I came up in the Lord and in, in just being able to hear his voice and just following, following him foot to foot. Um, whether it was sort of in, in ministry or just kind of in church and then, um, and then in the work. Um, and the response I got, I would get at times was a little bit sort of opposite to the, to the response you got. Because what I heard you say that your pastor said to you, it, it almost re registers to me as an affirmation of your gift and your, you know, and the, um, an affirmation of the accuracy of your ability to hear. And it was kind of like he was telling you, like you know, you're 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 hearing from God. Why are you hearing from God? Whereas for me, it was always that can't be God. You know, why is it that you're working with these people <laughs> and in this corrupt government system? You know, that can't be God. And why are you working such long hours? You know, God gave you a job. <laughs> you know, um, and and so now that you you, you know God has given you a job. You've forgotten about him. You, you, you know, you're not in church every day. You're not in church 24-7. You're not doing this, that, and the other with us. Um, and so it, it's, sorry about the ambient noise behind me. Um, it really was a very confusing time. But because, like you said, because I knew that, okay, when he tells me to do this and I do it, it works out and, and, and he sort of, um, you know, produces an outsized result. Um, that brings him glory and, and people are pra praising him because I'm there. Um, when he tells me not to do something and it's an emergency or it's an urgent thing and he tells me like, don't do this. Um, it turns out that we're overtaken by events and I didn't, I wouldn't have needed to do it anyway and I would have wasted my time. And so it gave me a lot of confidence that, okay, um, the, God is the boss. Um, whatever the minister says, it doesn't matter what he wants <laughs> because um, when, the, when the Holy Spirit leads me to do something, um, that's what I'm going to do because he's the real boss. And then when I do what he wants me to do, uh, everything works out far better than it would have. Um, so there was a comfort there. At the same time, when the Lord finally uh, you know, told me, I need you to leave this church, um, you know, the question I had for him was, do you know what mother so-and-so will do to me if I don't show up to church next Sunday and if I don't show up, you know, to, to sing in the choir next Sunday? And the question he had for me in response was, do you belong to me or do you belong to her? You know? Um, and so it was, for me, it wasn't even sort of like hard to keep submitting. It was more that it was hard to walk away because I felt like, um, I would be betraying um, an entity by following God. Mm -hmm. um, but he made it happen. You know, he made it happen in his own way because he does know how to extricate you from these situations as he sees fit. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let, uh, let me jump on this. Let me jump on another issue here. Dave. Most people are of the opinion that. Um, the shaping and the development for ministry happens within a very um, confined kind of environment where you have to be 
um, reading the Bible every single day and you have to pray for 15 hours a day and you have to be inside of the four walls of the church. Your, your, your life wasn't like that, huh? Um, you, you start training on, in, in all kinds of different areas. Explain, uh, detail for me, what were some of the things you discovered? You said some of it already, that you began to discover that you could hear God in business, that you could hear God in taking care of your family. But you, you, imagine you're talking to a couple people just like yourself at the age of 18 who are trying to discover their ways and they feel as though, well, they have to be almost like in a straight jacket and a Christian environment and a church environment for them to really step into the broad vistas of their call. Uh, you didn't have that experience. Tell us some of the things that you discovered that gave expression to the call of God inside of you and it wasn't the straight jacket model that most people have grown accustomed to. Well, first things, first things first with me, um, I am, I, I use or I see the word of God or logos as being uh, the foundation of everything that, that identifies or confirms God's word, God's word to me. So my, my first uh, foundation is there's never going to be a word from God that doesn't line up with scripture. That was my, my core value. My the foundation of my relationship started in reading the word, in hearing through the reading of the word. So once I was hearing God outside of the actual Bible or reading the Bible or in prayer or something like that, for me, it was always whatever it is I heard, it had to line up. With that which the word was saying, or will be confirmed in scripture in some some form or fashion. I felt like that was always going to be my safety. It was always going to be the parameters of, of keeping me in check. Now, as far as business is concerned, sometimes, you know, we would have ideas and sometimes, you know, as a business, in terms of practical business study, you do research or you study or you do um, you do analysis based on gathering data and, and that kind of stuff in order to have decisions made. With me, I had opportunities where I furthered my education <laughs> to the point where I actually did an MBA. So my understanding of business, uh, strategic business, I suppose, at a very high level was part of my training. But even within that training, I understood how to do business uh, outside of having to lean on the values and the principles, you know, built into, uh, into uh, the principles of business, I suppose, according to some of the, some of the founders like the Marxes and, 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 and these guys. So for me, business was sight and hearing and, 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 and obedience. It was... It was hearing direction from the Lord. I would get a vision or I would have a dream and the Lord would show a specific thing to do at a specific time. And I would not have the opportunity to do research or to go and do um, feasibility study or to build a business plan. But if I acted in that thing, the thing just took off. And that, that taught me how to... I suppose the scripture where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all your ways. And, and I, was, I was learning to move, to have the theory, the, 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 the theory of business, but still not trust in that which I knew. <laughs> but mm -hmm. the knowledge of it was just to allow me to navigate my interaction within the environment. So I could talk the language. So I could, I could, I could speak the terms of the environment that would allow me to have access to it. And of course, qualifications give people a sense of comfort in terms of who you are. But beyond that, you know, I learned to just care and act and really become married to the voice of God that would, and then as I say, would always line up with what's in scripture. One of the, um, one of the things, I know that you had a, 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 a nice business with buildings and furniture, et cetera. Rustique. Um, I think the Instagram page is still operating, right? That, that you still start, you're still selling that Rustique or, or you're done with that? Yeah, Rustique is active. Okay, good. The point, let me get to this point. Um, 
um, some, sometimes a person know that the Lord called them. They know that the summons of the Lord is on their life. They know that there's a demand. You could, you could see the design. You have a sense as to where it's going to go. But then it seems as though circumstances are not afforded. They're not coming in place. The ducks are not fall, falling in line that would allow you to kind of step into that broad plan that you believe that God has for you. And I know that you would have had those experiences it's as though well, you know what God wants to do with you, but at the same time, like, like whether it be leaders not, not um, trusting you, whether it be situations not um, really clearing a path for you, and two things you could do, you could try to bulldoze your way into the purpose of God. You could try to open your own doors by utilizing the good arm of your own carnal flesh. You can wait on God and just wait for God to kind of create the circumstances. But what was your plan? How did you manage that? I mean, I know, again, you're going to go right back into the area of business and taking care of your family. But speak into that for me. I mean, I have a call. I know what God called me to do. And it's not happening as fast as I may, may, may have wanted it to happen. It is not falling in place as quickly as it should. I'm being disappointed by all kinds of friends and colleagues who could more or less kind of kick a door open for me, but people just kind of so insecure and selfish, et cetera, and almost every single time, there you are. Um, you could launch, but then uh, not too long thereafter, there's failure to launch. Uh, explain to me and explain to all of us, how do you manage moments like those uh, in, terms of, and in terms of taking forward the purpose of God in your life in that situation? All right, so for me, <clears throat> I, I, I hold very strongly to the value of authentic relationships that God would put in your life. I believe that it's a principle that doesn't change, that relationships are key. Even Jesus needed a John to activate something in his life. You know, I mean, we have, you know, at some point in time have had relationships that may have gone sour, you know, that didn't work out. But that doesn't mean that relationships are not critical. So I always held high regard for the relationships that God would, be, would bring into my life to facilitate his purpose. Because I believe that there is no such thing as dispatching yourself or sending yourself. You can't send yourself. To, to, to go without being sent is, is you went. And I believe mm -hmm. that there has to be a context, a relational context from which purpose um, exists. Paul had his encounter with God on the road to Damascus, and he still needed a community environment to say yes to that which was on his life, to give legitimacy to that which he possessed. There still needed to be a company of agreement that allowed him to, to step into what God had called him to in dramatic form on his own. He didn't need anybody to confirm to him his call but he needed an environment because the call doesn't ever work in isolation. So I, I kind of, I, I stayed there in my heart. I said, God, I know that in due season, you're going to connect me with the place that I belong. That you're going to locate me with, with those that understand and see me accurately the way that I believe that, that, that you called me to be. So there was a season when I used to visit conferences and I would have been you know, part of different churches. And along the way, I would, I would always get prophetic direction. It's something about me being in a, in a conference that somebody would call me out and say, I hear the Lord saying this about you. And, it, and that, those experiences, you know, while not being as established as I would have wanted to be, kept me clear in my sight of the fact that God sees me exactly where I am. So there was one distinctive uh, season in my life when I was in Chicago. And I had a visitation from the Lord, literally in a hotel room. And, um, and in that visitation, the Lord literally came, the presence of the Lord was in the room, spoke to me, gave me clear instructions. And at the end of that encounter, my body was literally covered in gold dust. So I couldn't, I didn't understand what that was, but I knew that God had visited me that day. And that encounter I said, all right, God, in the conference, they were saying, you need to go back and start a ministry. You need to go and start a work. I was like, 
well, God, I'm not going to start anything by myself because I don't believe that that's how it works. So when I got back to Trinidad, that's when I got into my closet and I heard the Lord say, you need to connect with Anderson Williams. So Anderson is part of my story in terms of God switching on certain things in my life. I got back to Trinidad and Anderson had been out of the environment that we were both connected to. And I reached out to him and apparently he was, um, he was scarce. <laughs> Didn't know how scarce he was. He wasn't answering his, his phone, but because we stayed in contact via email, I sent him an email. I said, listen, God just spoke to me. I need to be connected to you. And to me, being true to these simple principles of relationship is key. God-ordained relationships are key to the release of that which God has for your life. There is an inheritance in, in the saints. As I continue to remain true to that, you know, my time, my initial season with just reconnecting with Anderson, it may not have looked like much. It may not have looked public. It may not have looked like anything. But I knew that God had spoken to me, that Anderson was a key person in my life and continues to be even to this very day. And in the midst of our relationship, in the midst of just sharpening one another and encouraging and, and saying, boy, what you're you doing? In the midst of that normalcy of, 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 of a commitment that is based on covenant, I know there's a word that people are used and abused. It's a biblical word. And a covenant relationship is one that goes beyond feelings, emotions, and moods. But it is a commitment based on the fact that God put you in relationship with someone. And yeah. you honor that person from a position that is not just out of your own flesh. So somewhere mm -hmm. inside of there, I saw through our relationship, other relationships began to connect, connect to me. Um, people began to see me differently. You know, we eventually started off um, um, our, our Bible teaching uh, session. Um, what, is, what, what was BLS at the time? And we brought people together and, and we actually kick-started a format of what would have looked like a non-conventional church, but really a place of sharing the word and just hearing the word of God ministered. We had a, an interesting uh, first format <laughs> where we have a more interactive session. And that went on for years. And throughout the formative season of trusting one clear principle that God never builds anything in, solid, in, in solitude. You can't build mm -hmm. by yourself. There's no true building with you isolated by yourself. I'm, I, I rejected the notion that that to me makes any sense. So that is where I was able to kind of become established. And, and that is in the way in which um, the ministry continues to, to grow this day. It is through building genuine, authentic, God-ordained relationships across the body of Christ. Yeah. Not according to denominational lines, not necessarily according to theological lines, but it is broader than that. It is really just where God would knit hearts together and just uh, see that, you know, inside of those relationships, God could release his purpose. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, want, I want to say clearly to all of us in the call here, I mean, when you hear Dave talk about um, relationships and the significance of it, um, he is really, he's, he's real on that. That is, those are not just nice comments. Um, that is one of the areas that I totally value in Crawford. I mean, now, even though we've had, we've had the most remarkable relationship, we spent a lot of time praying, we spent a lot of time thinking, we walked through struggles, we kind of rebuked each other, we encouraged each other, we had sharp confrontation, we had areas of disagreement. He understands some of my idiosyncrasies. I am weird. I am very, very weird. And um, Cropper, some, he says, you know what, um, Anderson, I know that in everything and everything, God literally connected us together. So you can't offend me by your weirdness. And so Cropper is a genuine guy when it comes to those areas. Um, uh, and so I want you all to, 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 to take note of that. It's a very important point because I want you to hear in Cropper and the things that he's saying is that Ministry is not shaped along your concept of what is the appropriate manner. You know, 
somebody lay hands on you and then you go to some theological training or you go to some kind of ministry training program and you're being mentored by some prophet or pastor. God has no real formula. You know, there are some prophets that God shaped on his own, shaped them all by himself. Jeremiah was not mentored by anybody. A guy like Amos was not mentored by anybody. And so um, that takes me down to this particular area. We're going to shift the conversation a little bit. Um, now, Proper, your, your, your gifting is like a very, very sharp prophetic anointing, very sharp prophetic gifting. I've been around a lot of prophets. I have, I have interacted with a lot of really good, solid prophets in their day. And um, I, I could say that I have seen how your own prophetic gifting has become sharper and sharper and sharper and, and very, very, very pronounced in many, many areas. Uh, tell me about the uniqueness of your own gifting and how God talks to you. How do you, how do you acknowledge the voice of God in that regard? I know also, I want to ask you to speak also into the areas of dreams, because I know you get a lot of dreams. God constantly talking to you through dreams. So talk to us about hearing the voice of God. I mean, there are other people on this platform who might be prophetic, and you don't have to be prophetic to hear the voice of God. You just have to be a believer. But speak into that a little bit um, in terms of your own perspective of hearing the voice of God and how that helps me in my ability to hear God. All right, so the first thing I would say about that is that for me, it, it is like a continued journey of trust. <laughs> I, to say that hearing the voice of God is an easy thing would be to misguide everyone that's hearing what I'm saying. I've always felt that there's an aspect of faith that is connected to how we actually hear the voice of God. But I hear the voice of God in different ways. So I would hear through like a word, like let's say I pray for someone, I would hear the Lord say, give me a word, one word. And with that word comes a sense. So I might hear school and the sense I might get is challenge, like school and challenge. So I take those two and then I use my communication skills to, to explain what I sense. So I know that it has something to do with your schooling, but I sense that, that it may be an area of conflict. I, I, that I, I, I feel that I sense that you're not settled about which way to go in a school environment. So hearing a particular word and the sense that goes with it is usually the container that I would get in order to minister to somebody about a situation that God would want to, to minister. But that type of one-on-one -on -one ministry is on the minority in my life. The things that I would hear are more macro. I would usually hear macro words. I would hear things that are like for an entire community or or that would describe a season or that would describe a sense of emphasis for a time. So those are the things that I hear more. And I would hear it sometimes where I'm going about my day, I'm minding my business. And the Lord would literally stop me and say, I need you to get a pen and I need to take note of something here. So I can, I can even talk about like what God is talking to me about right now. So right now I'm in John 8. And in John 8, there's an interaction that took place where the woman who was caught in adultery was brought before Jesus and they tried to test him. And just after that interaction, they, they, they continued testing him. And he basically said, you don't know where I'm from and you don't even know where I'm going. I come from another place. I literally have come from heaven. And the kingdom that I represent is not even of this world. And so right now, I'm looking into that scripture and God is talking to me now about the emphasis that he wants us to begin to play, to deconstruct our affinity to this local landscape and the localness of our ethnicity and our nationality and reconnect to our heavenly identity and begin to function from our heavenly citizenship. So that is something that I see now as an emphasis. So that would form the basis of how I research, 
how, how I would speak. And if I'm in a community, the Lord would show me areas to allow that word to have a unique expression to that community because everybody hears the word uh, or, or receives the word for them at the level that they're at and everybody's at different levels. So in, in a church that may be very much purpose-driven and understanding you know, God's mobilization and, and, it's re and, the, and the changes that are going on in the church, they may be open to hearing a word of change and partnering with a change in the frequency of our operation or function. But a church or an environment that is a little more traditional in terms of their approach, I will take that same word and I would repackage it, you know, to, 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 to the basis of our identity and our identity being in Christ. And, mm -hmm. and, and Christ being seated at the right hand of the Father means that how we function and how we live is from that place. So the prophetic in me works more along the lines of not just speaking to one-on-one. -on -one. That is to me more of a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom capacity. I could do that from time to time. And one of the things that I don't like, I don't like when people come and say, give me a word. <laughs> like yeah. I don't have, I'm not that guy with the switch that could at all times just flick a switch and give you a word. There are times where God would give that grace, where I'm in, a, I'm in, in an environment and for some reason, there's an access for me to hear concerning what God is saying to everybody in the room. That happens, and it has happened, but it doesn't always happen. It happens at times. And sometimes what also happens is when I'm in prayer or I'm spending a lot of time with the Lord, what oftentimes happens is that I leave the presence of the Lord with a particular capacity, and I take that to the, in the next environment that I go. So let's say I know that I have an, a, a meeting to do and I'm preparing, I'm preparing in prayer, I'm preparing in study. Sometimes in that preparation, God would literally clothe me with what I need for the, for the, for the assignment that is on hand. So when I was in Congo, the Lord woke me up at midnight at night and he gave me a word. And this is where the faith aspect of the prophetic comes in. He gave me a very tough word to give these leaders, a very, very challenging word. And I wrestled with God. I literally said, I don't think I could deliver this. I don't want, I'm in a, in a strange country. If these people turn their back on me or think that I'm mad, I go, I could be stranded in the middle of Congo. <laughs> so I had to wrestle with the obedience to say what I believe God wanted me to say. And eventually, I literally physically felt sick in carrying this word. I broke silence the day after and I, and I pulled the leaders together and I said, listen, this is what happened to me. This is what God is, is saying. And it literally was a word of, of rebuke. And I'm, I'm not the biggest rebuker guy out there. I want to affirm and, and, and edify, exhort and comfort. That's the primarily place that, that I want to function from. But every so often, God gives words of adjustment and to function in, in, in the capacity of giving adjustment to churches or leaders is something that I take very, 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 very seriously. But it is the area where I have had to learn to grow the most, to be obedient to say just exactly what God is saying to you. And to me, that's where it moved from being just a prophetic gift to functioning in the office of a prophet, sure. where it comes with a certain responsibility. It comes with a certain weight. And it produces life once released in season or produces death to you if you refuse to say what God wants to say. So that's, those are some of the areas of how the prophetic works with me. And I hope that kind of clarified what you're asking. Excellent. I see Kelvin has his hand up and I know that Ivan had his hand up earlier. So Kelvin, let me ask Ivan. Ivan has since um, put his hand down. But Ivan, do you still have a, do you still have a question or a comment? Um, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave, uh, I'm curious as to how you interact with um, uh, the apostolic gift and uh, are you currently operating with other apostles and other prophets? Uh, and then uh, secondarily, 
how do you see, how do you view the fivefold ministry gifts in the context of elders, local elders, and how they function within a local body? Okay, so the first one, in the context of other prophets and apostles, 100% yes. Uh, whenever I am with other prophets, there's an amplification. In fact, it's, it's beautiful to function with other prophets. Uh, this last trip in Congo, I was with Prophet Anthony Earl. He's a senior prophet and a very seasoned man of God for that. And we operated seamlessly. I mean, it's a joy to work with another prophetic voice. That, you know, even in when we are hanging out, I'm finishing his sentences. <laughs> and he's like, dude, you need to come out of my head. Because a lot of the times, uh, the prophetic frequency is like, it's literally like a, like a broadcast channel in the atmosphere. And if your antenna is up and you have receivers, then you can both hear the same thing. So working with other pro uh, legitimate prophets, genuine prophets, is a joy for me. And there's also, uh, even in this last trip that I did, there was an apostle in, our, in, in the team. And just the beauty of how a foundation was laid by the apostolic grace. And, and then the prophetic grace gave you know, further direction and unique clarity to it. The harmonizing of the gifts I see is absolutely necessary. And it's something that I actually enjoy uh, participating in a lot. The second part of the question, as it speaks to the fivefold, um, I believe that this is an area that God is, is, is redefining in this time because there has been a lot of emphasis on just the office uh, capacities of, of, of what Paul is talking about, prophets and apostles and pastors. But I think within uh, um, what is traditionally called fivefold, I call it the pentagovernmental grace of, of, of Christ, which is it's just five graces that 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 can be stewarded, but also released into the wider body of, of Christ. So for me, the the current expression of what God is speaking in where the fivefold is considered, or the the pentagovernmental graces is really a, on, a, on a full equipping of the saints to begin to operate in all of these capacities rather than it just rest on individual lives that could showcase it, but it's not transferable. This to mm -hmm. me is really a season of transfer, is a season of you know, real impartation. I get a lot of joy in seeing people who didn't have the ability to understand their dreams and understand their visions begin to learn how to interpret, how to hear God, how to see the symbolism that is spiritual language that, con that is consistent in the word of God, but then allow a maturing in our ability to edify ourselves, whether it be in teaching or whatever, every capacity um, that is within that structure. Excellent, excellent. Um, Kevin, you, you have a shoot? Yes, uh, thank you, Andy. And uh, Dave, it's good to have you on. But before I, I give my question, I want to encourage those of you that are on for the first time to send your uh, emails uh, and your name and your, and your email address in the chat to uh, Brenda and myself. Um, so we can get out we can correspondence to you and you can you know, stay attuned to what, what it is we're doing here for first timers. I just wanted to remind you, send, send your email address and uh, we'll be able to keep up. All right, thank you. Um, Dave, it's so good to have you on, man. Um, Thanks, I think, I, think I, talk, I think I talked to you about a week ago and you're not the man you are today, you were then. Yes. That there, yes. I mean, man, I mean, there is, <laughs> there's weight and growth and all this stuff happening, man. I, so good yeah. to have you on. I wanted to ask about development and training of the gift, if it's possible. Uh, yeah. and a few days ago, Brenda and I were parked on Hollywood Boulevard. And uh, approaching as we were parked, there was a, uh, an older Caucasian uh, woman walking with a, 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 um, a, a black guy. And so, and Brenda said, just randomly, that's mother and father, I mean, that's mother and son. And, and then when she said that, they were still slowly walking toward us. I said, Brenda, I think you got a word for them. Now, when those things happen, it doesn't mean that you need to go into prophecy right away, but 
are those training moments, are those moments that you can explore and see if God is in that or if, if something, how do you train? Uh, how can you be trained? How can you be developed in those kind of things, if that's possible? So, um, yeah, I mean, I've also seen where um, Brenda has, has said, uh, uh, you see that those two people there, they're not married, not in a judgment way, but I mean, just these are things that alert you know, they just come up on the, on the radar screen and it's, they're so definitive. It's like, you already know it. So how can those things be developed, if at all? I think that development is just the nature of life as with all this. Um, when I started to hear, when I started to hear from the Lord, I didn't, I didn't hear with wisdom. <laughs> Let me put it that way. It's like you heard raw data, but you still have to learn how to process raw data. Um, it was, it's like, it's like a well. Actually, I actually heard up, I got a prophetic word that clarified it to me very well. And it's like, it's like digging a well. When you're digging a well, you start off with tough surface at the top, dry tough surface at the top. And you keep going down. When you get to like about seven or eight meters, the, the, the earth itself begins to get moist. You have found water, but it's still moist dirt. Training for me is like when you go past the ability to unearth moist dirt and you get down now to what might be a muddy puddle of water. Now a muddy puddle of water means that you have access to liquid. Now that liquid may be able to wet a plant, but that liquid can't be humanly consumed, which means that you still need to go deeper. And the deeper you go now in this well is where the water now begins to become clearer, but you have to be able to then get to the point where the water or the well, you cease from activity. And then the sediments in the water will settle to the bottom. So here's what training for me does. Training gets your ability to get to the bottom of the well and be still. The stillness is the place from mature functioning. A lot of the times we hear a word, but it's still muddy. It's still not perfectly clear. It has value, but the purest value is when the word is released from stillness from the separation of your thoughts, the separation of your motives, the separation of your, your tendencies or the separation of your prejudices. When we begin to hear God with these things completely out of the way, that's to me when the water is pure, it's undefiled, and it has a greater value to those that we, we minister to, to those that we serve to. But as with all things, you need to start somewhere. But while you're starting to develop in a prophetic capacity, you have the gauges along the way that tell you, hmm, I didn't quite hit it. Hmm, I kind of hit it. Or within recent times, I would have seen in my own ministry where I hit it so hard that I didn't even expect it to hit that hard. That's when I know that I'm functioning from a greater level of stillness, a greater level of less of me and more of the Lord. Because every prophetic gift is still seeing in part. It's still part, the fullness of exactly what is. We, we know in part and we see in part. But if that part that we see in could be pure and without the sediments of our lives mixed into it, then we have a real vessel that God could use even in a more powerful way. So training brings us to that place of separation, of clarifying, of developing, so that we function from a place where we also have the ability to discern whether we hit it or we don't hit it, or if we on it or if we off it. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, Charles, I think um, you guys can just shoot the questions. Man. Yeah, Charles, you can go and then um... Then after Charles, I see Joel. Hey, Charles. 
All right, all good. Hey, Dave, good to hear from you, man. It's hey, Chad, good, to, good to see you, bro. Really sad that you're only in uh, Nairobi in the airport for an hour, so we couldn't yeah, get to have good. our little chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it was all good and excellent. I'm sure you had a good time. Actually, my, mine comes from two perspectives. One, by the way, um, I've, I've had the, the, the privilege of, of receiving prophetic words both from you and Anthony Al. So I've got that distinct advantage here. <laughs> <laughs> in the sense that both of you have been very instrumental in shaping some of the things we're doing over the years. I mean, Anthony many years before, and then now, and then you guys converged together. So I thought that was an amazing thing with uh, yeah. Suresh. But my question goes more in the direction of something you said earlier about when the people begin to rise within our community as leaders with prophetic insight, and I kind of want to zero in specifically in an area that's becoming pretty prevalent. I don't know if it's happening everywhere, but with us, it's happening a lot. People are beginning to have a lot of dreams now. I guess when we step, when we step into that statement, we are playing between uh, bad food, trauma, and hearing from God. So, so how do we help nurture that journey without damaging it? And how do we also tone down the excessive that is every other day there's a new dream in a different direction and we can't quite put the symbols together. How, how do we help nurture that kind of a prophetic person in our environment? Great question. And I, will, I could just talk from my own, um, my own journey where that is concerned. What I've learned with dreams is one key thing. Dreams are a language. They're a language, and they're principles that define a language. Um, if I'm speaking French, if I'm gonna parler vous français, then the language has certain things that make it identifiable against another language. So there's a scripture that says, um, my sheep hear my voice and, an, and another, they will not follow. And for me, understanding the language that of, of dreams as the way the Lord would talk to us in dreams, it's rooted in learning his language to us and learning the pitfalls of the faults along the way. Just as Proverbs would say, a wise man does this, but a fool does that. Learning the language of dreams to me is learning that duality together, learning that which is not from God and learning that which is, is God. That to me is the key to being able to hear and understand dreams perfectly. God has a certain signature. So a lot of the times, if I have a dream from the Lord and another prophet has a dream from the Lord, the symbolism is the same. The language is the same. God doesn't have 20 different languages to speak in the realm of dream. Um, there's a, there are universally accepted uh, things regarding dream language that could be studied. There are books on it that a, a dog means this and a snake means that and all of those things. So there's that aspect of understanding the symbols that are within dreams. And a lot of uh, Bible interpreters or Christian interpreters, for want of a better term, would, would have produced volumes of work where they could, they could show or identify within scripture how when God talks in dreams, that the, there are parallels in his word that give us the right context for interpreting. I lean, on, I lean towards that side. I believe that even within the language of dreams, that there is a clarity of interpretation that allows the word to help us to understand. It's not an area that I could say that I am 100% in, but people have come to me over the years. I've had a lot of very, very powerful dreams that God would teach me how to hear him through dreams on a one-on-one -on -one level. But also even like, let's say my wife has a dream or a friend of mine has a dream. Like I remember even like, I. I, I also believe that just like a language is not uh, exclusive to you, but it is, it is God's language. I could share this, like, let's say I have a dream. I would share it with Anderson. And I'll say, Anderson, I had this dream. 
And where and activate that scripture out of the mouths of two and three, words are established. I believe that those are the practices to me that keep the things that we hear in dreams, keep it streamlined, keep it clear. And once again, take the mud out of the water so that we're not being deceived along the way. I had a personal problem with dreams in my early Christian walk. <laughs> Let me tell you straight out. God used to give me dreams, like powerful dreams. But I read in scripture that angels used to come down and talk to people and all kind of stuff. So I actually challenged God one day. I said, Lord, why is it that you talk to me in dreams all the time? And here's what the Lord told me. He said, Dave, I speak to kings in dreams. Charles, that, that shut me up right there. Because the first thing it established to me is that God was telling me that one, I am a king. That single interaction, Charles, totally recalibrated my sense of self. If we understood that God literally spoke to Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream, coded the thing, and then allowed Daniel to decode it, it meant then that there's a significance that God does attach to dreams that we need to pay attention to. So whereas every single dream ain't God, there are many dreams that God would send to us that are critically important to our function, our relationship, or on our understanding of things that God would choose to wrap inside of dreams. So I have had to learn to humble myself and say, all right, angels are talking to me every week. But if God gives me a dream, I learn the language and it causes me now to draw near to the Lord for, for understanding and interpretation. I have found oftentimes that the Lord will choose methods of communication that will draw you closer to him, not further away. Anytime the frequency of a dream pushes you away from scripture, pushes you away from others in confirming it, pushes you away from anything that you know are established principles that you've learned in the word, those are the ones to be very, very clear to reject. In fact, expose it. <laughs> Don't hide out a weird dream that you get. Bring it out in the open and let two and three look at it and clarify it. And to me, that's where we begin to build community life around the word of God because God chooses to operate in this. And this is ancient, but it is also very, very important. I believe that when, when the word says that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh men, and there's going to be dreaming of dreams and, and having a visions, I believe that that is God saying, that is a technology that I am not ready to dispense with. That is real, is important, and our maturity in this needs to grow. So one of the things that I did, I actually did a course <laughs> with another seasoned prophet on interpreting dreams. I, I went to him, I joined up, I signed up, I paid, <laughs> and I sharpened my gift in that, in that area, learning to understand. I mean, one of the first things I learned is that you need to begin to define what type of dream is it. Is it a directional dream? Is it a correction dream? Is it an instruction dream? There are many categories of, of dreams that first of all, you, you from the contents of the dream, you have the ability to understand what is the container um, that God is speaking from? Is it God given a revelation of something? Is it an unearthing dream? Something that needs to be dug up? Is it a, a specific word for someone? Is it something for a wider context? So those are things that, as we become more mature, I think becomes important to how we hear God, especially in these times. Great question, Charles. Joe, yeah, Joe, you're up next, man. Joe, can you hear me? Uh, while Joe, yes, I, you... yes, I can. So, sorry okay, about just, that. Then before you shoot, Joe, let me just make a comment, make a few um, things. Let me just read some of the chat here, so that those of you who may not be following the chat. There are several areas. I see um, uh, Ivan basically made a couple of comments and talk about, I'm gonna pick it up right after Anik Benjamin say covenant, not of this dimension. Love that to say that the, that the hearing the voice of God is an easy thing. Love how Dave learned how to hear his voice. Uh, Lyndon Herrera wrote on the chat, wow, I can, identify with the, I can identify with the nuggets of wisdom and truth from Dave's life. The way he hears the voice of God is almost like he peering into my life and tweaking those similar areas in my life. Just this weekend, I heard God in the midst of being at the park with my kids. 
and I felt the tug of God in my heart to come up higher. His word to me is, I have not called you to function from the earth-based religious perspective that this environment is function. Uh, if, but um, I want you to live and function from your seated place in Christ, come up higher. The word stirs even more in my heart as I listen to this sharing his journey. Then um, uh, I see, uh, that's Ivan saying, please send your emails to, Ke to Kevin and Brenda. Then Anik, Anik um, make reference as she said, testimony nurtures much more than the lectures, imparts other dimensions, just great. Then Elijah, um, Elijah, Leon Elijah out of South Africa, he wrote, um, the reach and depth of the prophetic insight is refined and sharpened by one reach, by one's reach and depth of love for the one you are hearing for. That's an important point. The reach is sharpened by the, by the love that you have for the one that you're hearing for. You have heard it said, don't prophesy over the people you know and are familiar with, but I say you should prophesy over the people you love for it's this love that gives you a level of accuracy that is unprecedented. Then he also mentioned, that's Leon, Dave, I love the analogy of the digging of the well, getting to the water and then letting it still, still let it stand still for clarity. So these are so many comments that are posted on the chat. Um, okay, let me get you, um, get your comment. We're running all the time. Okay, Joel, shoot. Oh, yes. Um... It's funny that uh, Charles had a very similar question to what I was going to ask. Um, it was a pleasure to listen to you, uh, Dave, this evening. And um, I could relate again, like Andy was reading in the chat on many levels with you. Um, my journey is very, very similar um, in terms of, uh, I, I came to lots of convictions through the word of God um, and, and the authority that you give it is, is something I can relate to as well. Um, what my question is to you is, I was going to ask about dreams as well, but in conjunction with dreams, how do you deal with um, familiar spirits in terms of uh, knowing that the word you're getting is indeed from God and um, you're not being deceived or, or your own cognizance, your thoughts and your imagination and um, putting the desires of your heart aside. Um, how, how are you able to, because um, I've been deceived on this uh, on, on a few occasions, um, more than I care to mention. And um, I'd like to know how you, um, overcome um being deceived by familiar spirits and your great, own great, great question yeah and, and and i'll just give you all a, a, one of my personal tips so along my journey one of the things that i did is that i always ask for feedback whether it be good bad or indifferent i i felt like getting feedback is the one of the areas where I would, I would, it would help me to know whether I heard accurately or not. Now, not all feedback, because sometimes the feedback you get from people <laughs> that try to conceal something <laughs> might be might be erroneous. But you learn to hear God even in that also. So, like, let me give an example. So, I um, I have found that that given like personal prophecy requires a lot of boldness. I remember, you know, just reading how Paul would say, listen, pray for me that, you know, I, boldness would be given so that I could utter. There are some things in order to see that can come out of your carnality or could come out of your own, your own strength. But then there's a difference and you learn the difference when you know that in order to deliver this thing, it needs strength from a different source. It really needs the Lord to lift you into a place of confidence in order to be able to speak. So I would practice. I believe in practice. So um, that same um, point that Leon raised concerning love. Let's say I'm out in a restaurant somewhere. I'm the guy that sometimes I'm sitting there and the person that's serving me, they're like some of my usual targets. 
my heart just goes out to them. I see this person, they're working hard, they're on their feet, they're serving people, they're not always appreciated. And to me, people that serve are, 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 are people that I'm usually drawn to. So I would be like, all right, Lord, what are you saying about this person? And I'd believe God for a word for them. Now, part of it is really based on my desire for them to be able to connect with God. So I've always measured the value of a word with its ability to draw you closer to the Lord or to draw the hearer closer to the Lord. That to me is my yardstick of evaluation. Does the word draw the person closer to the Lord or does it just give them information that allows them to feel good about themselves or good about me? Anytime it's the latter, I know that I'm off frequency. So I always keep it clear in my heart that my intention is to draw the hearer closer to the Lord in some capacity, bring clarity, uh, cause the person to say, I love God for, for, for loving back on me. Sometimes uh, it's not even just a word of direction I would hear. Sometimes it's just words of affirmation, words like God sees your pain and he understands your sorrow uh, and, he, and, he, and he knows your labor. Those types of words, we may trivialize or think it's too generic or it's just basic. And oftentimes the posture that I adopt is, my desire is to communicate the heart of God to the people. Heart of God, the heart of God in his word and the heart of God that he is sensing right now. And oftentimes I've realized that the desire that God has to touch their hearts often is married within his word. So I would speak words that would cause that to happen and then ask for feedback. D did I say anything that I say makes sense? Oh my God, you have no idea. Da, da, da. All right, good. I say, thank you, Lord. I, I, I hit the mark. Okay, I wasn't off this time. And to me, that's one of the things that I did to help cultivate sharpness of the earring and just to keep the frequency of how I speak um, along the lines of just edification, exhortation, and comfort. But the most critical uh, times is when you get a wrong boy. When the person says, nah, <laughs> that was a, that's not me at all. Because I believe that as with all gifts, development, has within it areas where you say, this is where I need to improve. This is where I missed it. And getting feedback that mm -mm, it wasn't, you was not on point there. It makes me sit back and think, well, what did I hear wrong? Where was my heart not right? So feedback to me is, is my, one of my great um, evaluators. Now it is even better when done in a team. So if you have any kind of ministry going on and you have a presbytery that is functioning, Let's say you hear something in your heart for someone, but the team has like about two or three others. You, you hold your word back and you wait to hear what the team has to say. And if in what the team says, you get a sense of confirmation to the team, yes, lend your perspective and add. But if you realize that, nah, the team going in a completely different direction, take that as a check to listen again. Don't discourage yourself, but, but allow the, the voice of the team to help to calibrate you and to trust God that we hear God together. It's one of those things that Anderson and I say very often, we have the mind of Christ. There's something about the plurality of, of, of our speaking. When the spirit of God brings us together and we all speak the same thing, that it amplifies what God wants to say. So I, um, I receive it from that perspective to tweak uh, my heart and, and, and even my hearing not just alone, but also in the context of a team too. Hope that helps. Excellent. Uh, Lillian, um, our time is up. Huh? I mean, I, I would really want you to, to make a That's comment, fine. but can I ask you to make it brief? Shoot, shoot, Lillian, yeah. make it brief. Oh, okay. All right, so thank you. Um, can you talk about testing the spirit when you hear a prophetic word? Because there are some times when you just are not in that community's corporate setting where you can kind of wait for that kind of confirmation and get that feedback. Um, there are a lot of times when, yes, we have the word, but then we know that um, 
you know, people can take the word itself and, and sort of contort it into pretzels to mean whatever they want it to mean, whether they really, they're intending to do it um, to deceive or not. Um, you know, I deal with a lot of younger prophets and stuff like that, and, and, and they struggle with that. How do you teach someone to, to, to know how to test the spirit against the word and maintain accuracy without manipulating it from one side or the other? Thank you. Great question. You there? Hello? I think well, I'm here. Us. Yes, okay. I'm here. Okay. So the first thing I would say is that we're dealing with two different realms of things. I always like to draw the line between words spoken in the context of the office of a prophet and words spoken in the context of a gift of prophecy, a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. In the context of a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge, I believe that those words must fall within the confines of edification, exhortation, and comfort. I don't believe that the gift of prophecy was designed for, correct, for correction. I believe the office of the prophet, which is a different configuration and a different process and a different rank in his spirit, gives you the ability to say certain things and be accountable for certain things that you say. But if you are operating out of a heart that says, I'm desiring to edify. So to test for familiar spirits or seducing spirits, I think the first thing that you test for is the motive of the heart. What's the motive? If you know that the, the frequency of the motive is off, that I have, a, I have something to get back at that person or I have something uh, that, is, that, is, that is welled up as a personal bias that I have an opportunity to share, those are the things that I would guard against that familiar spirits could ride on. Opportunity, personal biases, personal convictions, those types of things. What I have noticed often with me is whenever I hear God, I'm often surprised because I know that this thought didn't originate from, my, from myself. And then when I hear those things, then I say, one, first thing, does this glorify God? Does this bring people closer to Jesus? That to me is my ultimate yardstick because it is my ultimate intention. Whenever flowing in the gift, is it an edification? Does it bring clarity? Does it edify them? Does it build them up or does it break them down? Does it make them feel better about their walk in the, in the Lord or does it make them feel worse? Does it make them feel, oh, woe is me, I am the worst sinner in the world? And comfort definitely has to do with the, the lasting intent of what the word is designed to bring people comfort. Listen, I realize that life is just as hard as, as it is normally. And a lot of the times, words of encouragement, words of comfort, break the intent of the devil to destabilize people's lives. So just at the base level of functioning to bring edification, exhortation, and comfort, there is a clear guideline that would shepherd you away from words that would do more harm and bring value to people's lives. And to me, as you grow, as you do it in a team, you do it under supervision, and you get your gift uh, stood, you have opportunity and context to do it. I think that is where you, know, you get to learn over time that these are the things to stay away from. This is a familiar spirit. That's not so good, that kind of thing. Now, as a, as a, as a, in the office of a prophet, there's a different context of word. God gave um, the prophet the word in order to release the apostle Paul. So you have to understand that that wasn't an edification, an exhortation, or a comfort. That was instruction and command from heaven. Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them is heavenly instruction. Now, the process of bearing a heavenly instruction on a command from Christ himself by the Spirit is a different type of hearing. It's a different weight. It's a different training. It's a different responsibility. Listen, and I'm learning. If God gives you a specific word in that from an office perspective, and you don't do it, there are problems. <laughs> God gave Jonah a responsibility to speak a word. 
and trying to run away from the responsibility yielded problems for Jonah. So I, I, I know that the word of God says, Paul says, man, you desire to prophesy, desire to prophesy, amen, desire to prophesy. But understand this, you see the callings to the officers, that's something that Christ does. We could desire these things, but it is based on divine appointment. And when we allow ourselves to be clear between the two, we don't start drifting one into the next. We don't start to feel, well, I am, a, I am an apostle to the nations and I could restructure churches. I am a prophet and I could tell you what God's saying. And you need to shut this down and marry this person and that kind of stuff. Once we clear about those lines, then we understand that there's a responsibility, whether it is a gift capacity or the office capacity, that you steward it with a pure heart and a pure motive. I think once we stay in that realm, we'll be okay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, guys, um, proper. Let me say thanks, man. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Good having you on the line this evening. Nice um, line, nice line, man. Seem as, though, seem as though we don't have enough time for the line. Last week, we actually bled into 315. So those of you on the call this evening, guys, sorry that we had we actually went a little bit beyond time again. The only thing that this... from the line is um, some more B-boy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We're gonna do that. You have to have your own more on that side. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys, um, I, I I have found this to be incredibly productive. Um, I have found both last week's slime and this week to be very, very informative. We tried as best as we can to have a nice mix of Dave's personal story and his own progress from, from discovering God and hearing from God at the age of 16 and making the transition into hearing very clear voices from God and um, the struggles he had inside of a church context, the areas of personal discipline, managing his life outside of a church environment, being very productive in business, being very fixed on managing his household because um, we sometimes get these biases where we think that ministry is studying the Bible and preaching and we ignore the fact that a very critical part of ministry is just you taking care of your responsibilities as a husband, as a father, as a man, doing what you must, the personal discipline and the issues of applying yourself as a human being and being as perfect a human as possible. We ain't perfect, we're not all perfect, we all have issues that we have to deal with, but we try to give you a very scenic route in Dave's world and then we circle back around and then focus primarily on the whole utilization of his own gift and call and I like the questions. I, I wish we had more time to engage in more questions, but you know what? We're gonna do some more and do, and maybe have Dave back on another time where we could basically concentrate on certain specific questions that, uh, that would be targeting areas of prophetic functionality, prophetic administration, uh, and things of that nature. But for today, thank you very much for tuning in today. I found this to be absolutely wonderful. It is just one of the three templates we're gonna be using and going forward. Maybe next week, we'll go right back to the tutorial model, or maybe next week we might consider another model. But for today, let me turn this meeting back over to Kelvin, who will sign us off. Thank you all very much for joining in. Beautiful session today. Okay, Kelvin, body your call. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you again, Dave Cropper, for such a great session. And all of you who've made contributions uh, tonight and this afternoon. So uh, with that, we will bid you farewell. Please uh, submit your emails, those of you first time listeners uh, and first time participants, if you have not done so, please uh, provide that in the chat over the next two or three minutes. So thank you very much. Good night, good day all. Thank, thank you, good night. Good night. good night all, God bless. Bye everyone. Good night. Okay, that may look to be it. We're going to sign off now. Thank you.